Welcome to the Visual K podcast. I'm your host, Frederick, also known as Rolling Black. And with me today, as usual, I have your co host, Alexi. Your new little guy, Aaron. <laughs> Just keep getting better. Uh, <laughs> and I'm the editor, James, also known as Plant. And uh, on today's episode, we're going to continue on where we left off with the cassette. And we're going to focus on their first full length album, Disorder. Let's get in on it. Let's get in on it. <laughs> Let's get in on it. <laughs> So, uh, Disorder was released about six months after Madara. So, either they had these songs kind of tucked away from Madara recordings, or they had ten songs worth of ideas in their head right away and just hit the studio. Well, they've always been about rapid-fire releases, like, their whole career to this point. Like, new new single every month or two. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, I think they had one, maybe one of the most insane release schedules in Visual K, really. I cannot think of any other band off the top of my head who released that much stuff in such a short amount of time. And also quite inventive stuff and kept developing along the way so you could actually chart their progress in real time. It's almost like they released things as they wrote them without much regard to like, you know, calling some stuff. They used to, you know, when they had 10 songs written, they released those 10 songs. It's not like they, you know, made a selection of their best material over three years and make an album. They used to put it out there yeah and also it's all kind of widely conceptual most of their mini albums they have definitely have like a unifying theme and this album definitely has one as well um what they had been going for around this time was that they wanted to become a serious band and specifically in order to achieve that they actually started to wear darker makeup and darker clothes <laughs> uh, i guess in that culture uh, being dark means being serious but you kind of understand what he's talking about if you think of like the sound on Wakaramichi, for example, and mm. how they look, the sort of naive adolescent innocence that's imbued in that release, and then compared to this one. So this is sort of them really trying to be like a big boy band. Yeah, I think the sound is, has noticeably changed from the early stuff on this one. Yeah, they're like, don't baby us anymore. We're all grown up now. <laughs> We're big boys. We smoke cigarettes. We say fuck in our songs. Yeah, we rap now. <laughs> 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 the funny thing is that you know this album is released like two years after their the, after their first single. So you know they're probably still like twenty one or something at the time this was released. Yeah. The <laughs> children. I mean, it is kind of funny that they're talking about middle like middle aged people in interviews when it was like, yeah, when we started, we wanted to just be a cool band. But now I wanted to convince our audience of something. And I was like, dude, you were playing at Aria like 15 minutes ago. <laughs> and he's basically planning his set list for the Tokyo Dome already by that point. Yeah, that's, uh, they, they, they certainly were riding the hype wave at that point. Like Maybe that's also why they rushed this album out, because Madara did so well in the sales. I think we said last episode it placed second on the Oricon charts or something. Yeah. This one also apparently placed on the charts, but I couldn't find out exactly where. Different, different. 562. Yeah, 562. Really <laughs> big achievement. Well, I mean, it, it did feel like they had a schedule to catch up to. And they were also growing at a very rapid pace. And you can chart that with just how much their venue size increased Oh yeah. throughout this time. And if you look at the tour final for this release, they're definitely ready to go major. And soon enough, they did. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's all it's all about trying to keep the momentum going, and I think they were just kind of really blessed by having people able to write songs at this kind of breakneck speed. Yeah, their managers were probably just like, they need more, they want more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's better to go hard when you get the chance, right? Like, yeah, I think they were, you know, really hungry for success as well. Because I think they, like all the other old bands now, have kind of really slowed down with their releases, haven't they? Yeah, um, you could say that they'd also stop developing their sound as much. But then, when you compare it to other bands, let's say someone like Bless Their Sweethearts, but Kiryu, who, while a good band, hasn't really gone through any a really discernible stylistic change in years <laughs> no isn't it just you know the chinese restaurant uh, soundtrack what they've been doing <laughs> i mean at one point they did like develop the technique and increase pace and stuff but now it, it i mean bp records bands in general are very averse to change mm. but yeah because they just kept hammering new stuff and constantly switching things up 
And when we got to this one, also like as far as their conceptual changes, the theme for this album was hoodlum, whatever that means. <laughs> I can see that actually. Hoodlum, yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of it has a very distinct sound compared to all the other releases. Yeah, I definitely get a hoodlum vibe. Hoodlum, yeah. I suppose it's like some guy with attitude. Maybe that's why a lot of the pseudo rapping is in the tracks because he wants to be a cool kid. And all the lyrics that are on the verge of like, "Hey, fuck you, dad." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a mature effort. Hoodlum core. Speaking of mature effort, should we get on the first track? Uh, yeah. Let's go. Uh, let's do intro. He said prison, fuck, I don't know, there's many good, <laughs> good bits but on this album. Uh, yeah, my notes say, what the hell is this rap garbage? <laughs> I kind of oh, like it. <laughs> I like it too, I think it's cool. It, it's like an atmosphere piece, it's like, check us out, we're, we're hoodlums, <laughs> we're hanging yeah. out in the alley, we're shooting craps, See, it fits, all the generic yeah, stuff. It fits the theme. I, I will give it that. It fits the theme. But I, I don't know. I think it's really fun, uh, f kind of, you know, the, his English is just a bit too funky. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> yeah, at the end, he's like, I'm pretty sure he's saying disorder, but it sounds like disorder. <laughs> yeah, no, he, at this point, he cannot pronounce a single word. Disorder. <laughs> disorder. You know what? It is actually only now that I realize that he's saying disorder. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've heard this album a million times in my life. Uh, although, this is the first in the long line of Gazette intros, because they had one for every album, I guess, actually. And for them, it's a very sort of direct way to express their concept. They're always very on the nose mm. and don't really leave any sort of any, any room for interpretation, really. Like, this is the sound and the theme of the album rapping in english <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, uh, it, it it does set the mood yeah it's about it though yeah, yeah. i really don't have anything more to say about <laughs> it this <laughs> no it's an intro okay let's go on to the first real track which is track number two the social riot machines I love the stylization of the S's in the song title. It's just, it's incredibly edgy. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's, again, speaking of on the nose. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very hip hop, but also at the same time, it reminds you of Kesha when she used to do that. Ahead of their time. Yeah, they inspired her, I'm pretty oh, sure. Of course. Actually, I'm a big fan of Gazette. <laughs> what else is that? Oh, they were the original party band. <laughs> No, see, I think that this is actually one of the best songs on the whole album, though, so shouldn't make, make jokes about it. How oh, you would want to protect the good name of Social Riot Machines? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, the title looks funny, but the, the song itself is really good. Dude, I would say even the track title is very memorable. Yeah. I, I actually I like the song. It's It's got a fun, heavy energy, even though it's pretty much just like rap metal. But I, I kind of I have a soft spot for that. I spent a chunk of my youth listening to new metal. So I, I think by the time I got to Gazette, the first time I heard Dis Disorder, new metal was kind of like overplayed for me. So like that kind of rap metal style, I was like, oh God, this shit again. So it didn't really <laughs> click with me the first time. But coming back to it, um, it's nostalgic. So I, I, I like this song a lot more now than I did back in the day. It's kind of a stage dress song, huh? Yeah, it feels like a stage dress song. They probably use it like that. Yeah. It's got a lot of like repeated chanting Shouts. Yeah, repetition, and it'll get the crowd kind of just chanting and shaking their fist. Yeah, shaking their fist. <laughs> yeah, you see. Well, yeah, uh, aggression. <laughs> oh, like, they actually do that in Japan, though, no joke. Like, for fast songs, they just hold their hand up and, like, do this. <laughs> well, we have no video, so we'll have to describe what you guys are doing, and you're kind of just holding your hands up in a fist and wiggling them. Yes, <laughs> yes. Wiggling them in place. This is when I realize I'm too 30 for this shit, because when I think of all the lives when I see like people flailing their hands, like <laughs> legitimately hand is hoisted in the air and it's flailing by the wrist. So no other part really moves, but the wrist goes like this. When I see that shit, I'm like, 
I'll never go to concert because I, I couldn't <laughs> physically. You're gonna get carpal tunnel. <laughs> oh yeah, That's a cardiac arrest. Old cart this old man out of here. No, yeah, for really fast songs, you know, songs where you can't do like full style fist bumps or whatever, they do that uh, shaking from the wrist only. Uh, and uh, it's just very awkward. But yeah, also I wanted to add about the the track itself that uh, I think it's very interesting how it changes the pace abruptly several times throughout the song. It kind of gives it a very interesting momentum. This is absolutely a Gazette trademark, and this can be seen in some other songs as well, namely Maximum Impulse, probably Antipop as well, and then Carry, of course. Um, I think this song is in the vein of songs like D.I.S., but more fleshed out. There definitely there is more variety in the riffs inside the song itself. But the sort of ADD pace um, allows them to try a lot of very, very interesting different things. Uh, the classic cassette buzzsaw riffs are like on full force. And I think that's what also separates this from like generic new metal, let's say, because it has that genetic material from really, really early cassette summer deep inside. Like there's a sense of melody is still in there. Uh, there's also a section of the song that, uh, okay, it's time for the obligatory reference. There's a section in this song that sounds exactly like the Third Empire by Deering Gray. The the part that goes like spark and spark in Third Empire, and this one is yelling some other nonsense instead. In all fairness, considering that these two are basically contemporary, this is very likely not a coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, oh, I mean, it's just a small segment, otherwise it's obviously very different songs. But, oh, it's yeah. definitely sort of branded, like it's so uniquely Gazette. I cannot yeah. even imagine any other band playing this exact same song, except maybe Gossip, but for different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also I wanted to add the vocal effects on the track, it's also quite nice. Uh, Rookie has experimented with many, many interesting vocal filters, or effects, I should say, throughout the years. Some of them are okay, some of them are not that good, and some of them are interesting. So, if James could play the sample which I had queued earlier up, and this is from the tour final for this album, and it's the song Social Riot Machines, and this is right before the chanting part. What the fuck is that? <laughs> <laughs> he sounds like a demon. Yeah, it's some sort of like put on demon voice. Oh, yeah, and that was also the section that was lifted from the Third Empire. On their early DVDs, he doesn't scream and growl without a vocal effect. And I wonder if this is a stylistic choice or an insecurity or possibly both. My guess is a little bit of both, mostly insecurity. And lack of technique, I think. He needs oh, to yeah. bolster his harsh vocals. I, it's a very common thing that, especially VK bands do, I feel like. They add like tons of reverb and uh, effects and things on the vocals to make it sound more distorted and harsh than what it actually is. And I think this is like next level. It's basically some sort <laughs> of like a demon box voice. Yeah. You can also tell he's doing the old standby where you cup the mic. Where you do this. That's a new metal staple also. That's basically like if your <laughs> voice is too weak, but you can make it sound a little bit scratchy, you can cup the mic and it sounds more intense. He was definitely learning along the way. Yeah. As with the other guys, but I think someone like Uruhan Aoi, for example, started out like mega talented already. And for Rookie, it took a little bit to catch up. <laughs> That's pretty common, though, in VK, that the vocalist is the, you know, the weakest link, so to speak, at the beginning. But the one who draws the money. <laughs> yeah, if he looks good. <laughs> yeah, he has his eyes that are just so smart. We should do an episode <laughs> at one point on VK bands with really, like, unnotable vocalists. <laughs> uh, like, real, like, comically bad vocals, or... Like basically like vocalists who really lack the charisma that the rest of the band has. Oh. They're rare, yeah. so I think it'd be a pretty short episode. Yeah, like a band that's, you know, if this band had a better vocalist, that would be so so yeah. much better. Yeah, that exactly. kind of band, yeah. Well, not even necessarily better, but like just one who's just kind of meh to look at. Or interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, listeners, if you have a band in mind, uh, let us know on Twitter. Yeah. What are some bands that... Pretty meh vocalists. 
see the thing is that you don't want to really like speak out of turn because i was the first band that i was thinking of was eins by the you know the band from kyoharu's label but then i think like you know what probably he was thought of as like the pretty boy and all the bands were really going for that one i just don't know because i wasn't there mm. next one uh yeah let's move on track number three carry Yeah, this is one of my all-time favorite cassette tracks. It's uh, it's just great. It's just really, really great. I can't tell who's talking in the beginning. In the intro, there's like a spoken word part. It sounds like English, but I don't think Rookie's voice can go that low. I was listening to it last night, and I'm like, there's somebody talking in the beginning. Like, it sounds like broken English, but he's like... <laughs> oh, could it be the same guy from S, X, D, X, whatever? SDR? But like... Oh, a different maybe. sample i yeah. like some in basically like actual english yeah but like kind of i don't know pitch shifted etc etc yeah also one of my favorite songs from gazette overall and by and far my favorite track from the album rapid fire sections really fast pace so much cool shit like where they really shine first of all incredible riffs for them uh incredible breakdown and every time they do breakdowns around this time, whether it's in like Haruni Chirikeri or Anatame no Kono Inochi, they always hit so hard, partially because they're rare and partially because they did you so well. Yeah, and I think also it's worth mentioning that this song has, like maybe that's what you said, but I feel like it's also worth mentioning it has so many different things going on, but it still feels very cohesive. It moves through tons of different movements. And I especially want to bring attention to the extremely catchy chorus, which uses some really 90s VK chord styles in the chorus, which is interesting, like not doing like uh, the kind of like um, power chords, but rather using those, um, uh, what's it called? I, I, don't, I don't know terminology. Aaron, help me. What's it called? <laughs> the chord progression? Are you talking about? Uh, no, but like, you know, they're utilizing the uh, uh, higher strings rather than the lower strings. Oh, I mean... For the chords. I don't know what the term is for that. That's a guitarist term. <laughs> this is the expertise you listen to the VKPC yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> Use the promo code Bears Hunt at discount. You get 10% off, 10% of the time. <laughs> Just inject the ad right there. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh... Yeah, also about Carrie, though, uh, the, the kind of soft, creepy section with whis whispered vocals mm -hmm. after the first heavy, chaotic part is also really neat. Yeah, I do like that they were doing, still doing weird stuff with vocals in this album. Because at this point, I was, uh, y y you kind of get worried that a band will lose their original quirks. And that's been sort of their thing since the beginning, where they're always just doing something weird with vocals. And this one has like samples and spoken word parts and whispering. It's pretty cool. Dude, it has a growl. It has a growl. Yeah, like the deepest one they had done up to, up to this point. And when it happens, it, it's very like brutal. <laughs> you know, if they did that for every song, we wouldn't necessarily care as much as if you do. But when it comes with a breakdown in here, it really makes an impact. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, just overall, like you said, one of my favorite cassette tracks overall. So definitely my favorite of this album. Uh, okay, should we move on to a more controversial one? I, I'll, I'll be controversial. Um, the chorus, the, after the first run of it, I get sick of it. I can't do it. I like the rest of the song. But I think by the sec second time I'm hearing that, Kelly, I just, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> uh, this is why the second that Frederick said that we're moving to the next song, it actually means that you will not get this part into the episode. Yeah. <laughs> and I think It'll it serves work. you right. Hey, uh, actually, one more thing, though, about Carrie. Why is there a question mark? Yeah. Like, is he asking? Oh, if well, she... if you don't know if you're going to carry that expletive or not. <laughs> yeah. So okay. you, you ask yourself. Carrie? Like, he's asking you, are you going to carry something? Is something getting yeah, carried? Yeah, I assume it's like asking, he walks up to someone and, uh, <laughs> and to offer to carry their stuff. It's like, carry? 
<laughs> yeah, that's what the song's about for sure. Oh. He's just doing a grocery run, and he just wants a little bit of help. Oh. <laughs> no, he's going around offering help to people. Harry, I mean, he is for his community. Yeah. You heard the intro, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna cut all of that. Let's move yeah. on to the next. Yeah. next, <laughs> next song. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so it's uh, track number four, uh, Sakuru Gata no Yutsu. All right, well, this is probably my favorite track on the album, so I think same. some of you hate it. Really? Okay, good. No, so it's, oh, it's my, yeah, it's my number one. I feel like this is a nice return to form. It feels like their older stuff. Yeah. It's fun. It's like an upbeat, pop, punky kind of song, but it, it sounds like sort of what they were trying to do in the sperm, or, sperm margarita era, but actually good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a great solo. Yeah. Why did you say some when there is only one? Only one what? Who doesn't like the song? <gasps> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, is there only one of us? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, because yeah. this is a three against one affair. Yeah, oh, for yeah, some yeah. reason, I thought I was the only one that was going to like it, actually. No, no. I think this is actually considered like a sort of a classic cassette song. But the thing is, for me at least, that I think this... Uh, the way the song starts is so incredibly grating and annoying. <laughs> it just goes straight into this, like, probably one of the ugliest sounding, like, guitar parts Gassette has ever made. And a very whiny chorus where Uruki is just, like, being very annoying in general. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the thing is, that it's a shame, though, because, like, if you can, like, live through that first sort of 15, 20 seconds, the song turns pretty all right. It's just that... For all of my life, I've just heard the first 10 seconds and I've been so nauseous, I've turned to the next track. So I actually, I'm not even sure if I have heard the full track before recently. Uh, have you thought about going to the hearing store and getting a pair of new ears? <laughs> yeah, go to the hearing <laughs> store. Dad. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know what to tell you because like when this song pops on, that intro, I love it. I'm like, yeah, give me more of the song. It's really good. Mm hmm and again i gotta bring attention to the synth horns they're all over the place and they sound yeah. amazing they're great. i love it yeah they are awesome uh this is vk jazz yeah, it, yeah. It <laughs> and it kind of sounds like it was written as far back as like wakare michi it has that same vibe as that single yeah, yeah it's absolutely. like a gazette dna I did, that sort of went through my mind i don't think it's necessarily that old but it was released with like zetsu and misainen so it is it does predate some of the stuff here uh, there is some sort of like traditional gazette progression, which is like the main riff is like the sort of the central theme, like repeated twice, and then a small flourish at the end of that main riff. Mm -hmm. Then the two guitars fade into the background and they start doing something else, which in this case is the acoustics. Ruki and Reita sort of show up and they sort of set the conflict or the theme or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the guitar is burst back. And then the energy starts amplifying, and this is when Rookie also starts increasing his speed in his singing. It's kind of like quasi rapping in a way. And then it goes into the chorus, and then it's supposed to hit hard, fucking synth horns, mm -hmm. all that shit. It's good stuff. Uh, and they kind of use this formula in a bunch of songs, uh, which they then eventually abandon, of course. But this is classic Gazette in classic form. Agreed. Oh, but Frederick, is the reason why you don't like this because you don't like Rookie's voice? Uh, no, uh, no, not at all. Actually, I think the guitars is the main thing I don't like about the Literally intro. The like, it part. just sounds super <laughs> whiny. It just sounds so whiny, the guitars. I just can't stand it. Like, the way it just abruptly goes into a chorus without any warning. That's, I don't know. The it's VK? extremely jarring for me. No, it's just jarring. <laughs> it's just jarring for me. I'm used no, to intros. I mean, it does kind of, the sound is kind of thin. If you know what I'm saying. It's very up high register. Sort of, yeah. So when it has all these creatures and shit like i can see how it would be great it yeah it does sound thin and tinny and also uh, uh i don't know i also feel like it sounds like the guitars are not tuned properly or something it just everything sounds very disjointed to me but i guess it's just my my brain playing tricks uh i made a note that says it reminds me of Anne cafe and the like and i suppose that's pretty accurate for 
the Aristotle I, I song. I think this is exactly what my dad said walking into my room. <laughs> and hearing this like, Isn't this like one of your other bands and cafe? I'm like, yeah, dad. No, they're not the same. No, <laughs> dad. Are. Stop being so embarrassing. They're way cooler and edgier, and they're also grown up. Yeah. Did you see the dark makeup? My dad wouldn't even know what it is. Son, is this Kiss? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my stepdad did say that once. He walked into a room and was watching like an immortal TV, and he looked at it and he was like, "Is that Kiss?" I was like, "No, <laughs> Kiss is lame. <laughs> this is cool. And it's like fucking Call of the Winter Moon or some shit like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is the worst one." Oh, Kiss is a Shiranui band, so he's not wrong. True. Uh, <laughs> yeah, true. You, true. you made Kiss cool. <laughs> Gene Simmons' son. <laughs> <laughs> it's my Han Mei. Uh, okay, uh, you you want to move on? We should end on that one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's let's move on to uh, track number five, Maximum Impulse. I don't know why, but this album has the same vibe as the movie Space Jam. <laughs> what? <laughs> We're like Box Party playing fucking NBA. It's exactly yeah. the same vibe. It's like corporate hip hop. <laughs> I'm definitely getting Space Jam vibes. From this song, I get a little. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> Space Jam with fuck. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> hey, could, could you just play a quick part from the beginning of the song? Yeah. Because I think the most defining feature of this song is right in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that. What the hell was that? It sounds like an old man trying to get up from a chair. <laughs> yeah, it does. I, uh, I, I used to kept laughing. I think I've laughed every single time I've heard that part of the song. It's just like, ooh! Yeah. yeah. Hey, man, let's try different stuff. <laughs> yeah, try, try different stuff. <laughs> try different stuff. Oh, yeah, what you... if I just, like, channel my grandpa for a second? Yeah, dude, do it! It'll be so rad. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you get the inspiration if it still kills. <laughs> uh, so I, I think uh, the consensus is that we find this song a bit silly and I, I definitely agree with that just that, that's why i sampled like the one part where, like give it away give it away it's like, dude okay <laughs> yeah I've... first off that was in my notes um that very part i was gonna have you play that part because it's essentially <laughs> just the red hot chili peppers song give it yeah, away give it, it away oh, give yeah. it away now it's oh the exact God, same song <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Oh, good Lord. For, yeah. for a VK fan to reference Red Hot Chili Peppers is ballsy. <laughs> it's balls. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, see, uh, like, the rest of my notes for this song is just that it has an interesting, like, punky chorus with some o o o o o background vocals. Yeah. Which they do really well on this album, considering how kitschy it could be. Uh, yeah. I think that it's kind of... Uh, proof of concept in this case there's mm -hmm. also a very neat guitar panning from left to right which is mm -hmm. a little unique on this album you know what it, it does remind me of overall instead of like space jam it actually reminds <laughs> me of like eternal goteosa but like really updated revamped and reworked you could sort of if you really squint your eyes see like quartet playing this Totally. Oh, dude, this is a total quartet song. If quartet yeah. was ripping off Red Hot Chili Peppers, it would, it would sound like this. <laughs> <laughs> Very accurate. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think it could be basically any of those bands that were doing this kind of style around that time. But I guess the quartet... <laughs> okay, guys, wait. Dream of California Cation. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh... Well, okay. But yeah. That's amazing. amazing. Uh, I killed it. <laughs> uh, I think that this song, at least I would probably consider this song sort of borderline filler on this album. It's not a song I feel like it's an essential part of the album necessarily. It's all right, but it's not, you know, a masterpiece that, you know, defines the album. Yeah. I'd say one part that I like is in the opening. Uh, it sounds like Rookie is like, not the old man part. Although that's that's pretty notable. 
There's a, there's a part where it sounds like Rookie is like yelling into each of your ears separately. He's like going, and it's very kind of ASMR. <laughs> It's kind of weird, but... Wait, it's like R- Rookie's ASMR burping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Rookie drinks a Sprite and then burps into each of your ears the song. But that's disorder, and I think that's what makes this track cool. That's I think this whole has a place. I'll vouch for this. I will put it in the top five tracks. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good song. It's not bad by any means. Um, it's At least for me, I haven't been able to sort of grasp its essence, though. Yeah, it doesn't really connect for me either yeah i would not put it in the top five um but i don't hate it and it and it does capture that hoodlum vibe so it it suits the album i think yeah yeah i agree sounds like hoodlums okay so before we move on to the next track maybe a quick message from our sponsors this episode is sponsored by rare's hut Rare's Hut is your source for rare and not-so-rare imported Japanese rock, metal, and visual K outside of Japan. Their prices compete with street prices in Japan, so save on import fees and shop at Rare's Hut. If you're a new customer, be sure to enter the code VKPC at checkout to get 10% off your first order. I was on there earlier checking out their bargain bin page and I saw one of my favorite hidden gems still sitting on the rack after what seems like years. It's a cassette tape by a band called ZXS. It's only $7 right now and it's worth way more than that. At least to me it is because it's super good crunchy glam metal with electro industrial elements. Snag it while you can because honestly I might buy it again just to pretend I'm discovering them for the first time. While you're at it, they have ZXS's last album on there too for super cheap. If you buy them both, I might just kiss you on the lips. By the way, if you're enjoying this episode, want to help us out, please subscribe. Give us a like or a five-star rating on whatever platform you're listening to us on. Uh, Recommend us to your friends. You can also follow us on Twitter at the VK Podcast. Come hang out with us on the VKGY Discord server as well. We have a channel on there. You can meet new VK fans and hang out, make suggestions for the show. Uh, Catch all new episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much anywhere else you can listen to podcasts. Okay, and we're back. So uh, let's move on to track number six, which is called, hang on, uh, Hana Kotobo. So uh, this song kind of started okay, but I actually forgot it as I was listening to it. And then the guitar solo came in and it caught my attention and I actually really liked the guitar solo. But then I forgot again that the song was playing right after that. So, Uh, Yeah, my impression is pretty much the same as Aaron. Um, I think the song is mostly pretty forgettable, but I really do like the guitar solo. I I listened to this song a lot as a kid. Not a lot, but I just definitely remember it. So it's a bit nostalgic, but um, overall it's not in my top five or anything on this album. Yeah, I think I'm there as well. My thing is, though, that I think that cassette ballads are fundamentally usually very forgettable, but they're never really bad. I mean, this is not definitely not a bad song. I especially like the acoustic parts. The acoustic parts are very neat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know, the cassette ballads never really move me in any way. You know, you, when you hear a ballad, you're supposed to, you know, want to cry and... <laughs> Crawl, crawl into a corner, yeah. but cassette ballads doesn't really do that for I me. I think o- o- Okuribi is still my favorite cassette ballad. That's still the only one that I really go back to. Oh, that's the connoisseur's choice. Yeah. It's interesting because it has a lot of the typical cassette ballad landmarks, which is very long. It probably ends in a fade out. But I <laughs> think it might be just slightly darker, less sweet, um, probably because of the theme as well. It has a bit of a, like a dramatic edge. Which one? This one. Oh, could it be? Oh, we're talking oh, about yeah, a different yeah, yeah. song now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, let's honestly, the bad songs, let's just go, let's just talk about the old songs instead, you know? <laughs> no, but I mean, I get that because even though it's like very typical Casa Ballad in a yeah. sense, it is a bit different uh, in mood specifically. Uh, now that we got all the old people out of the way, I can say that as a fan, I like it. It's, it's not one of their best. Um, 
this track is maybe on this album the most ahead of its time as far as their discography. They kept this format of ballad for a very long time, and I think that's where the vestiges of the original Gazette sound survived the longest. I mean, the traditional melodies and soloing lived on in these ballad tracks for a long time. Mm. It, it's it's nice, but it, it is for slightly forgotten by the band also, as far as like ballads. This is one that they don't really play. No, it seems to have, to have been barely played at all in the last... 10 years only when it was like a disorder specific live what was that yeah and i think they sort of recognize that that it falls in between because then the ballads on the next album cassis and dln have much more identifiable personalities i agree yeah it definitely feels like a filler track and the band probably feels the same <laughs> yeah you never want to say that right but when a band sort of ignores a certain part of the discography for a long time you can kind of tell like which stuff they're really excited about them, which stuff they are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so should we move on then to track number seven? Yeah, uh, track seven. Yeah, let's go. It's uh, Tokyo Shinyu. This song is one of my favorites on the album, and I think it's also very, very unique in their discography. What do you guys think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to say that this song has really strong, like, sort of Angura rock vibes. It reminds me of, like, early Mook, yeah, that kind of nostalgic, totally. uh, yeah. In that way, it's a little early Gazette, because this is maybe a little bit more somber uh, than some of the early stuff, probably because of the theme again, it's like lovers double suicide or something as such. And it has that like adolescent theme as their other tracks about young people do, but it's a bit more dramatic and a little more mookish. Yeah. It's got that old Japanese jazz pop kind of feel that a lot of Angora bands go for. Something I noticed when I was listening to it is the int the, the drum rhythm and in the intro and in the chorus is the same as the one in Yokan. The whole time I was like, hey, this is Yokan's beat. It was like huh. It's like you could sync this up on a playlist with Yokan and the the verse, the intro and the verse would sync up with Yokan's outro. Huh. This is one of the first occasions when Rupi is clearly trying to transition out of the guy who sang Wakaramichi into the guy who is singing in later Gazette albums. Definitely going for that more velvety crooner voice than this weird nasal eternal <laughs> Kotelsa guy, <laughs> which uh, maybe wasn't really meant to be in the Tokyo Dome. And in here, he's already going for a different kind of look. Mm. Uh, the song is also extremely long, at least it feels extremely long. It's like six minutes or something like that. Which I suspect could be a reason why it's played so rarely, or just because it's kind of like, uh, like you said, like an outlier on their discography sound, so maybe it doesn't fit in so well either. It is an oddity. It's almost like Audrey on my cap. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I see what you mean. Uh, I like the solo at the end as well. I think that's pretty cool. Does it end in a fade? It ends in a solo, doesn't it? Which fades out, kind of. Okay, well, if you end on a solo, you can fade out. That's that's allowed. Does it end in a fade? Do you want to play it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can. okay. Go for the last few seconds. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a fade. Yeah, but I, I will allow this. This is kind of like a, some anime outro type of guitar <laughs> melody over there. Really cool. You know, if we ever make merch for the show, one one of the one of the like we we should have a shirt that says uh just quotes Alexi saying, I think it ends in a fade out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll buy that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I, I would place this song pretty high on my list uh, for this album. It's definitely in my top five, for sure. It's It has a very strong identity. Yeah, I like it a lot. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, let's move on. Track number eight, which I uh, am going to pronounce as SDR, because I don't know any better. I would assume it's SDR. But you could say Sex Dex R. You could.
Okay, who else hears rock and roll incest? Everyone. Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> everyone. <laughs> okay, everyone. That was my first note. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> rock and roll yeah. incest. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a, is that a hoodlum thing or? Oh, the theme of the this album was fuck you, dad. So <laughs> and fuck your dad. So wait, what is he really saying? <laughs> rock and roll is dead. I think. Yeah. Okay, I thought it was something uh, like rock that. and roll yeah. is dead. When you know it's rock and roll is dead, you can kind of hear it. But if you don't know, rock and it, roll it's rock is and roll dead. Incest. Rock yeah. and roll incest. Yeah, it's an odd rhythm. It's even difficult to say. He doesn't say is dead. He says like is dead. Yeah, it's because <laughs> yeah. he doesn't know what he's saying, yeah. and so he doesn't know the cadence. He's just like, oh, yeah, yeah is that's dead. it. Yeah, just reads Katakan off a paper. Yeah, oh, I wouldn't be surprised. But overall, it's a pretty good bouncy rock song. I mean, the pre chorus screamy part's cool for me. It kind of falls off after that, but it's a fun enough song, I guess. It, there's like a thought provoking lyric in the chorus, actually. Its head can be danced off in the rhythm of shit. That's a that's a good, uh, good line. That makes <laughs> oh, me, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah, oh, it is good. It makes you think. Um, compare this to shit like. Black Spangle Gang, <laughs> because I kind of think these tracks sort of part of the same lineage, and Black Spangle Gang I barely remember. At least this one is a little fun. But as like a thought experiment, imagine this track with Yuna and the drums. Oh man! Because I think that would bring a little more weight and energy. Yeah, it could be interesting. And I think this song also benefits from its length. It knows it doesn't have too much to offer, so it doesn't try to overstay its welcome by two minutes, like some bands are guilty of it's just sticks there at three minutes and 20 seconds yeah it's kind of nice having a shorter track after that last one which is a bit long yeah absolutely i think even this track and the next one combined makes up around the length of the previous one yeah uh and More, maybe. what or move on maybe or yeah yeah that, that was going to be my like okay. uh, uh smooth segment <laughs> Whatever you say. It's no longer smooth. smooth segment. No, yes. it's all jacked. Uh, it's neither a spiky. segment or a smooth. <laughs> no. No. Yes. Uh, unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> now for my Painful. unpleasant segue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's like sandpaper. <laughs> okay, no, no. Uh, uh, okay, so it's uh, track number nine, anti pop. Are you guys familiar with The Pillows? Yes. I don't know, something about this song reminds me of The Pillows a little bit. In the sample in the beginning, that kind of screeching guitar on the left side, it gives me a Pillows vibe. That's the only part of the song, though. I don't mean to say that The Pillows sound yeah. like the Gazette, but it, there's just some of the uh, guitar techniques in the song that kind of give me I that could vibe. Hear it. And I, I like it. Yeah, especially in the beginning, I can I could totally get that because The Pillows kind of had like this kind of raw rockish kind of feel and some of their songs are pretty upbeat like this but um yeah this song is um, a lot more punky than the usual pillows kind of thing so it's it's still got that sort of production style of uh pillows for sure and i like the one two three four at the beginning that's a good overdone staple of punk music always good i love hearing that yeah <laughs> one two three four that's so that's so good i never get sick of it this is i think the best of these types of tracks on this album. It has the combination of that attitude and also that rapid fire pace and trying lots of different techniques in a very short amount of time. It's a very fun song. Yeah, I feel like it's the best punk track on the album. Punk inspired song. I think so too. Uh, absolutely. Good kind of smashing windows with a baseball bat kind of song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the English is a bit jarring as, she, as usual. I wish there was more Japanese, but uh, in general, it's just a very interesting track. The way it sort of starts out with this jam-esque thing and then just go straight into this very raw punk number. I wonder when they play this live, do they do that jam part or do they just move straight to the fast uh, punk stuff? They do the entire thing. Um... And actually, that first part is composed by Reita. And once he did that, he just brought it to the rest of the band and said, compose this. And I do believe it's like popularly credited to Reita overall. But I think at this stage, most of the songs were a band effort. Hmm, that's interesting. But it is kind of like 
nice that they have all these like small cues of things like that funny intro and then the one two three four etc like they're just throwing shit in and everything sticks <laughs> wasn't super into it but it was still uh i'd say probably maybe track uh, like if i gave a top three on this album i'd say this would probably be number three for me just for the energy yeah it's up there for me as well yeah exactly that it's just a very fun song like it's um it's high energy and you know it's very good for um if you're feeling low and you can just put it on and then get energized i always feel low so help <laughs> get all the help you can get uh, but as far as these type of songs we can probably agree that black spangle gang is the bottom the worst of the worst and maybe bite to all from the cast is single if you guys heard that but the best one is probably ruder yes that's probably unanimously agreed on by pretty much everyone including the band yeah but this is like the upper I would probably put this off straight after Ruder, actually. I have a strong affinity for this one. It's a cute little number. Uh, okay, so let's go on to track number 10, which is called Shichigatsu Yoka. You guys were saying that Sakurogata no Yuutsi felt very throwback to early Gasset. My notes say this track. This track oh, yeah. feels very much like early Gasset, especially the second half feels very early Gasset ish. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I was I was actually gonna say this song sounds like almost a direct continuation of their early sound, which I liked a lot, but it's it's it also feels like it's uh like if I heard it on their older tapes or on their older CDs, I don't think they had tapes. But um if I heard it then I'd be like pretty good, not as good as these others, but it still establishes like it's still it's still part of that overall sound. It's kind of a a more of like a formulaic version of that that old old cassette. And this is because the song is a direct continuation of Wakaramichi on purpose. That makes sense. What I gathered from a little bit of online detective work is that it supposedly is happened like taking place some two years after the events of Wakaramichi. And off the top of my head in the lyrics, it ends in this narrator seeing the person who he broke up with and just kind of wishing her well. And it's something like, uh, just promise you'll be happy or something like this. Really, that type of, uh, I uh, uh, my girlfriend left me, but I'm pretending that it was a mutual decision and I just wish her well. <laughs> Oh, please come back. <laughs> please come back, but if you don't, you know, it's not like I care or anything. I'm not speaking from experience or anything. <laughs> I only relate to this song artistically. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to mention the bass is quite nice and clear and actually drives the song forward on several segments. So that's pretty interesting. Overall on this album, I think. The bass is a little underrated, yeah. maybe, or underappreciated. Agreed. Solid bass lines in this whole album. Yeah, and particularly on this song. And I feel like one of the things that really stands out to me on this song is like it has a very solid momentum. Like it just moves from one kind of phase of the song to the next without like I don't know much, not much transition or like taking a breath and stuff. It's just it just keeps going. It's like a train or something. They are so good at working a melody. The guitarists like they have this central theme and they just keep switching they make small alterations like they move a little bit of left and a little bit of right and they add these tiny flourishes again and get them move on to the next one it's really like the beauty of gazette and there's i guess no other band that did it exactly like them and that's why they're so recognizable yeah they're really good at switching from section to section just sort of effortlessly changing modes but also it feels cohesive yeah and that solo is really good. And um, I like how sort of in the middle of it, the guitar is still going, but the, the bass and the um, percussion kind of break down a bit as the solo is going. And just has this really cool vibe to it. They're so smart for being so young. I mean, this is a little underappreciated because they really thought of this as like a weeb beginner band. And in a sense, they are, especially like later on in the career. I mean, they were also so prolific that... They made tons of music that all sounds different, especially in the early stuff. There's so many like small things when I'm like, these guys are geniuses. 
in the songwriting department, I think, super underappreciated and sort of like unjustly brushed off as a band that got popular because they're pretty. And they're not even that pretty, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be a pretty underappreciated song by the band themselves, though. It's only been played five times in the last 13 years. Which is pretty much the revival tour for this yeah. album. Yeah, exactly. Before it was 2005. It is an odd vibe. They prefer to end sets on stuff like this and they got other songs for that, so that explains it. Yeah. That's true. They are more recognizable ones that the fans probably prefer as well. Uh, okay, so uh, final track of the album then, not counting the outro, it's uh, track number 11, uh, Sarawa. <laughs> Uh, I guess we are taking off the gloves for this one, jumping at each other's throats. <laughs> well, I really like this song. Okay, I will join you. What about you two? What? Well, I really <laughs> like the rhythm of the song, and I feel like it's a song that I could get more into the more I listen to, but it didn't connect with me as much as the other uh, the other songs like uh, Social Riot Machines and Zakuro. But it's a pretty good song i mean there's nothing wrong with it it's just one of those songs where i'm just like all right well that was a that was a good last track it's a little hanakotobaish in that sense right yeah exactly because it has a lot of stuff which i'm like yeah this is very smart but then at the same time a lot of other tracks come to mind before this i think that's fair i think it's a really good track it's definitely not the best track on the album and the other ones that are better kind of outshine it so I think in the context of this album, it's not the most amazing track, but I do really like it. And it's something I would listen to on its own. Yeah, I think the thing, at least for me, is that with this album, the things I associate this album with and what I want to hear when I put on songs from this album, it's not really this. I mean, I want something that's, you know, short and hard and chaotic. I mean, if I if I want to put on something from this album, I would put on like Social Right Machines or Carry or Antipop. Because that's like the go-to sound I expect when I want to hear stuff from this album. See, this is when you miss the whole picture of Gazette. They are kind of short and angry, but then at the end they are for the people. This is an anti-war song. <laughs> anti-war song. We're singing yeah. all together, or something to that yeah. effect. It's so on the nose, too. I mean, the lyric is literally an anti-war song. Like, you, they want to make sure you know what this song is about. <laughs> Very subtle, really flexing lyrical muscles on that one. It's cool. I like I, I like that. No reason to dilly dally around the fucking <laughs> point, right? Just just get to it. Uh, I don't know. Feels a little heavy handed to me. I guess it's so heavy handed that it's the reason why they haven't played this song almost at all. Yeah, it seems extremely rare. They only did it three times for that revival tour for the album, and before that, it was the actual album tour back in two thousand five and four. So. You know, at the same time, when we played that sample and I was listening to the guitar stuff on it, I'm like, this is really cool, again, like... Yeah, it is, it is. I agree. But you know what's the best part? The next track? No. It ends in a fade out. <laughs> Let's go. Oh. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. How many fade out cassette tracks do we got already? It's like five. Five out of ten. Twelve, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, no, it's I, 10 out of 10, but... <laughs> uh, I, I think it's just, you know, the, if you start out working for uh, Kisaki, some things just never go away, and one of them is unnecessarily long fade-outs. Oh, shit, they learned from the pro, like the <laughs> king of kings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kisaki songwriting school, there's only one thing on the board, and the students are like, end in a fade-out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at least one minute. In a way, fade-outs are sort of like a representation of Kisaki's ethos in that he was like, there is always more to come. I will never quit. This is not the end of me. This song <laughs> fades out because this song goes on for another six hours. If you don't hear anything, just put up the volume. <laughs> yeah, get it back. exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, your volume's going down? Just crank it up, dude. <laughs> Then when he's ready, he'll come back and go to the first original volume <laughs> setting. <laughs> Bust your eardrums. Don't make an impact.
<laughs> okay, so let's go for the outro, Disorder Heaven. Since uh, Alexi name dropped Quartered earlier, I will name drop another one of his bands, which is The Mad Simpson. This sounds a lot like something the band The Mad Simpson would have done. How's that for an obscure reference? Quite obscure. <sighs> Finally, because we've been doing so much stuff on vanilla and entry level bands that hearing Mad Simpson, I, I cannot even describe how happy that makes me. <laughs> <laughs> but the, it, it has that kind of weird, like, distorted uh, uh, rap vocals and, you know, uh, demented instruments. Well, it's demented, all right. This outro is so weird after the last song, honestly. Like... Yeah, it is a little strange. Like, I feel like if they would have ended it on the fade out, like, it would have been a send off. Yeah. Yeah. And this kind of, I guess it kind of wraps it up together. Maybe they wanted to close shows. With this when they kind of walk off stage maybe before the encore i hope they walk off stage with this song <laughs> <laughs> definitely don't want them on stage <laughs> this album was priced at about 30 dollars usd when it came out and wow i think yeah i don't think it's worth it now 30 dollars <laughs> Jesus that's Christ. No, it's one of the <laughs> damn. <laughs> damn, that's savage. Yeah, that's my most scathing review right there. It's not worth 30 but bucks. All albums in Japan are 3,000 yen, so it's like every <laughs> album costs this much. That's a good point. <laughs> I just yeah. think, man, I don't know if I'd buy CDs nearly as often if I lived in Japan. What a CD is worth is what it's being sold for at rarasod.net. Your yeah, source no. <laughs> for rare and not so rare. <laughs> Too soon. Visual K. Also, uh, on the on the note of uh, capitalism, I think this album got released with two versions. One was silver, one was gold, and I don't think there's any other differences. Very PS company. Are you sure about that? Isn't it just the multiple pressings? Because there's three presses of this album. No, they I think. came out at the same time, as far as I know. Oh, at the same oh I time. thought it was like first and second press, but I wouldn't close out. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong. I guess my research could be. Yeah, off. I think. I think I own the third press because I found it in a hundred yen bin in Japan. <laughs> that's about what Aaron would pay. Yeah, hundred <laughs> yen. Day. That's enough. One dollar. That's uh, that's all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, but like to just sum up the album as a whole, like uh, <laughs> I guess Aaron, we already know what you think of it, but the rest of you, like, how do you feel it places in their discography? I love it because I'm a fan. <laughs> so they don't really have an album outside of like one or two that i don't love um it has flaws but i think it's a very unique document and in that sense it's worth it but it's not like a canonical visual k album like per se but it's a very strong outing in the discography yeah that's basically what how i feel as well i think it, it is my favorite actual full length by Gasset because I'm not counting the compilation of the three EPs as an actual album. But um, yeah, I mean, that's not saying a ton though, because I have some issues with their, I guess, mid period by now, you would call it like the toxic era and stuff like that. So there's not a ton of albums I really love by Gasset, but uh, I would say this is one of them, even though it's not a 10 out of 10, it's certainly a very strong effort. I mean, if I would put it like this, they came to your town or whatever, and they're like, yeah, we're playing Disorder Full. You'd probably pay as much for the tickets as they would ask, provided that it's within reason. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, would, I would pay to see Gasset come to my town to play Toxic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or whatever it was, we found a, them. We found a, when we were looking at setlist, we found them playing a cover of uh, was it uh, Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer? <laughs> <laughs> I would do an entire Christmas evening of Gazette song. Yeah, they should do a mashup, Ruder the Red Nosed Reindeer. Oh, nice. <laughs> I am Ruder of Reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd see them play this live just because I would hope that they'd play the intro and the outro and I'd 
uh, I, think I don't know how that would work. <laughs> I think both of those would be played over the speakers. I don't think Rookie oh. would like free free. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so there, right? Right? <laughs> Tries up the mic like, is this thing yeah. on? <laughs> <laughs> and then he just walks on stage doing this uh, rap thing. You know? Yeah. Uh, so I guess it's just James left. How did you feel about the album as a whole? Uh, I like it. I'm not that into like punk in general so sort of the american pop punk influence in this album doesn't do a whole lot for me and i think the tracks that i really um connected with are like uh track four sakura and um track 10 shichikatsu yoka are probably my favorites because they remind me more of uh gazette's older stuff yeah that's fair if nobody else has anything else i would like to cap off this episode with a line which i had written uh, which wasn't supposed to be on the episode, but I realized that it is quite apt. It's like Aaron's inauguration speech. To cap it all off, I would like to call the reader's attention to just how well this has dated in comparison to the material that was to immediately follow. The viciousness of their street attitude and signature gazette rating appears to speak more to us today than the new metal stylings of nil and stack rubbish that seem to us as if from another dimension. The machine gun pace of carry leaves us shell-shocked while a strange two-riff interlude like Maggots has us wondering if that had been it. Listening to this album today, you'll catch the Gazette one final time before the most significant stylistic shift of their career. And that is actually true. This is the last time we would hear, hear Old Gazette. Yeah, you're right. It's a good breaking point. A sad truth. Very well spoken. Ray La Single that came immediately after was sort of in between eras. It had a song called Akai Kodo, which already had a very new metal riff. And that was basically the beginning of the end. Yeah, set us up very well for the next cassette episode. Stay tuned. No! (laughs) Ah, Don't worry, it's not going to be a third one in a row. Okay. But also, we're not going to tell you what the uh, next episode's topic is, because we haven't decided it yet. <laughs> the next one is Matt Simpson. <laughs> yes. Don't, don't. We spoil it. Yes. Matt Simpson. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, all, I guess all that's left is to uh, thank everyone for listening, and as usual... Rock and roll incest. <laughs> <laughs> nice. He's that switching it up. Huh?